I hope you've already watched the video on the survey process in infection control. And now we're going to talk a little bit more and get a little more in depth about F441 and federal regulation. In October of 2010, CMS issued a revised F441. They combined several regulations all into one, and that's why you get this big mass of stuff under F441. Uh, they put several regs together. The linen handling and hand washing went right in with 441. If you will look at 441 carefully, you'll find that they've, they've really set up a great uh, tool to help you have a good infection control program in your home. So I'm going to look through these slides with you just quickly and, and actually read the regulation. I don't want to read too much to you, but I do want to read the regulation to you. The facility must establish and maintain an infection control program designed to provide a safe, sanitary, and comfortable environment and to help prevent the development and transmission of disease and infection. The facility must establish an infection control program under which it investigates, controls, prevents infections in the facility, decides what procedures such as isolation should be applied to an individual resident, and maintains a record of incidents and corrective actions related to infections. Preventing spread of infection when the infection control program determines that a resident needs isolation to prevent the spread of infection, the facility must isolate the resident. The facility must prohibit employees with a communicable disease or infected skin lesion from direct contact with residents or their food and if direct contact will tra transmit the disease. The facility must require staff to wash their hands with each direct resident contact for which hand washing is indicated by accepted professional practice and linens. Personnel must handle, store, process, and transport linens so as to prevent the spread of infection. That was just the regulation, but they've also given us some great guidelines. We call them the interpretive guidelines under F441. CMS, when they reissued this tag, they wrote an intent. It fills you in on what they intended for F441 to mean. They give you a long list of definitions, so if you're concerned and don't understand perhaps what surveillance means or how to put it in place in your home, you can look at those definitions and it will give it right to you. Standard precautions, it's all there. Uh, they give you a lovely inner overview of infections. Um, it will talk about the significant source, what, that infections are a significant source of morbidity and mortality, so there's a huge cost in death for our residents related to infections. They account for up to half of nursing home hospital transfers. The estimated cost in dollars, $673 million to $2 billion a year for infections in nursing homes. So it's really important that we get some good infection control practices that reflect our current CDC guidelines. And after you've read all of that information about how to set up your infection control program, you will see there's an investigative protocol and that is specifically written for surveyors to tell us how to look at your infection control program. So you are welcome to get out there and read that and see exactly how we survey. Maybe do a little survey of your own. We frequently cite F441 for hand washing and improper use of gloving, failure to use gloves when, when they should be uh, used, and I, I have seen staff take double gloves, they put on two pair of gloves, and do whatever it is that they're going to do, whether they're changing a dress, usually dressing changing. They're changing a dressing, they've put on two pair of gloves, and when they get that dirty dressing in their hands, they peel off that top glove, and guess where that finger goes? Right down their hand, and leaves a trail of contamination on that second glove. So double gloving is never acceptable practice and we do see a lot of that. So um, I want to, while I'm here, also talk just a little bit about alcohol-based hand rubs. That's become very acceptable. CDC is saying that's a great way to prevent infections and so we, we are looking at those as a hand hygiene tool and I hope that you're looking at them as one too. Uh, they're very accessible, you've got staff carrying them with them, they're right there, they're handy, they take less time than washing your hands. However, if you've got some spore-based or some virus that alcohol doesn't kill, you've got to be aware of that. So if you've got C. diff or something like that in your facility or your home, you will want to have your staff wash their hands with soap and water. I watch a, a nurse aide early on in my survey career, it's been a while since I've seen this, 
but she did a lot of peri care for a resident. She had, had brought this resident into the room, helped him into bed, washed her hands, put on some gloves, and did peri care, incontinent of bowel and bladder. And then she said to the resident, you want to give me your teeth? And the resident did, spit her teeth right out into that staff person's hand with that dirty glove on, and she went and cleaned that resident's dentures with those gloves on that she had just provided peri care with. So those are kinds of issues. We see that occasionally. In fact, probably pretty frequently. I've got the numbers farther down. I'll tell you what the numbers that uh, we cited that. Or maybe I already said that. So I've just got some pictures here. Uh, some of the things that we look for in long-term care infection control when we're doing that tour and when we're walking around your building, some of the things that send up a flag are those IVs, G-tubes, glucometers are a big one. Glucometers have to be cleaned with a special cleansing agent that is designed for that, not an alcohol wipe, and they should be cleaned between each resident. In fact, it would be ideal if every resident that needs a glucometer had their own glucometer so that you're not um, exposing anybody to those bloodborne pathogens that might be there. Um, again, standard precautions, we don't know who has what just by looking at them. So be sure that your glucometers are being well cleaned and stored properly so that you're not sharing any of those bloodborne illnesses among your residents. Foley catheters are always looked at and uh, equipment that's shared like this me mechanical lift that you see here. Staff who've done peri care and then move that mechanical lift from, from one room to another carry those uh, bacteria right along the hall with them into the next resident's room. And again, dressing changes for pressure ulcers or whatever kind of wound care you might have. We'll be watching some of that while we're there to see that they are using current standards for changing those dressings. Infections in a wound will increase your scope or your severity. So I put in here the, the CMS's scope and severity guide so that you can take a look at that grid yourself. We use this on every survey to determine where we're at on that grid that you guys are so um, concerned with, so, and we're concerned with. Um, any infection that was avoidable or preventable will up your severity on this grid. I'm gonna, there'll be one of these grids on the website so that you'll be able to pull it off with your handouts and take a look at it. And I know you won't be able to read it in the slideshow very well. I made a slide just with standard precautions on it just to make sure that I again said standard precautions are so important. You don't know what somebody is carrying when they've got an infection. You may not even realize they're infected until it's way too late. So everybody should be using standard precautions. That kind of wraps up my talk on the a regulation of F441 and I hope you'll stick around and watch the video on some other regulations that will be important in your infection control program and I'll also give you some websites that you can look at to uh, find this information.